Okay, let's talk about some basic epidemiological uh, concepts. Um, epidemiology is uh, the field that studies how diseases are transferred within a population. Um, and it usually looks at them on a population level rather than the individual mechanisms of how a disease is transferred from one person to the next person. Um, basic concept, if we're talking about epidemiology, then we're talking about a disease which is communicable. Um, so a communicable disease is a disease that can be transferred from one person to another person. Uh, most diseases we think of as being uh, communicable, but there are actually a fair number that are not. For instance, um, it's very difficult if you get, say, salmonella poisoning, right, salmonellosis, uh, you can't really pass it on to somebody else, at least not very easily. It, it does spread to a certain extent through the fecal-oral route, but Mostly, you're going to get it through contaminated food products. Um, uh, same with, uh, say, Lyme disease. Uh, humans are a dead-end host for Lyme disease, so we can't really pass it on to anyone else. Uh, but, you know, by and large, most of the diseases that we consider in, in microbiology, most of the... the pathogenic diseases are communicable to a greater or lesser degree. Um, sometimes they can be transferred directly from person to person. Sometimes they require a, uh, a, a biological vector intermediate, like say uh, malaria does. Um, communicable and contagious are similar words uh, and technically mean pretty much the same thing. But generally speaking, if we describe a disease as being contagious, what we mean is that it is easily transferred from one person to another. And there's no hard and fast definition of what easily means here. But like there are a, a number of diseases that are you know, you can pass from one person to another, but it's not exactly easy or super common uh, for that to, to occur. Rabies, for instance, right? Rabies can be passed from one person to another person, but it's very, very rare that that happens. It's not easily communicable. So we wouldn't really describe rabies as being a contagious disease. On the other hand, something like influenza or the common cold is very definitely contagious. Um, the transmission, right, the way it is transmission, transmitted and the rate at which it is transmitted is determined by a number of factors. Some of these are inherent to the pathogen. Some pathogens are just simply inherently more contagious than others. Uh, but a lot of the other factors have to do with the environment and human behavior and as well as the, he, the, the uh, peculiar human biology, biology of the host. Um, if you have, for instance, a population where everyone is crowded together and sanitation is poor, uh, then disease transmission will happen much more rapidly if you have a population that is washing its hands constantly and physically distancing themselves, uh, then transmission happens less frequently. Um, you also have to deal with things like uh, host immunity, right? The, if, if a certain number, the, the more higher the percentage of people in the population who are immune, the lower the chances of uh, of transmission are because you can only transmit to a non-immune host, what we call a susceptible host. Uh, some diseases are non-communicable, which means that you can't, they don't spread from 
person to person. Uh, a lot of these are, are uh, organisms that exist in a uh, environmental reservoir. For instance, Legionnaire's disease, Legionella pneumoniae, um, you can only get by inhaling water droplets, and it's not spread through droplet transmission. Uh, they have to be water droplets from an environmental source. Um, uh, things like that. Um, the, the Lyme disease, which you can only get by being bit by a tick, and the tick can't re-get it by biting you. So you can only get it by being bitten by an infected tick, and the tick only gets infected by biting an infected, uh, usually, mouse or some other small, warm-blooded mammal. Uh, if we're talking about epidemiology, we really aren't really concerned about non-communicable diseases. The epidemiology really only concerns itself with communicable diseases because it's a study of disease transmission. Um, a lot of epidemiology is like... It's, it's sort of a combination of uh, math and statistical modeling and microbiology and public health. Um, and I'm, I'm obviously I'm not going to ask you to know the mathematics of it, uh, but I do want you to know a certain amount of the terminology related to epidemiology. Um, first thing to know is that epidemiologists are usually not concerned with the absolute number of cases. Uh, this is actually something that bothers me in, um, in reporting about COVID. Like, they'll say that New York has now surpassed, you know, blah, 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 as having the most, uh, you know, infections uh, of any, you know, in the world. Um, but that doesn't mean anything. Because, like, if you've got, if you've got a town that has 100 people in it, and 50 of them are infected, that town has a real big problem. If you've got a city with 10 million people in it, and 50 of them are infected, well, that's a less big deal. So, uh... When we're talking about epidemiology, the absolute number of cases is almost never something that we care about. Like, you know, saying there are, you know, 200,000 cases of COVID in New York is meaningless to an epidemiologist. What we largely care about is the rate, right? What percentage of the population is infected, not infected, things like that. This is like, you know, if you've got 200,000 people in New York that are infected, that's different from having 200,000 people in Wyoming who are infected. Like, it's the same absolute number, but you model those things extremely different. Uh, the, when we're talking about the, the, the rate of movement within a population, the rate of occurrence of the disease within a population, there are a bunch of terms that are relevant. Um, first is the attack rate. Uh, the attack rate is the likelihood that a, um, a contact event described as a, um, you know, anytime you have somebody who is contagious comes in contact with somebody who is susceptible, meaning that they are not currently infected, nor are they immune. Um, they have, so they can get the disease. Uh, and it's the percentage chance that that person will fall ill, or if you want to talk more in populations, which is actually more relevant, it's the percentage of people who become ill in a population after an exposure event. Um, and this is dependent upon a bunch of different things. Uh, some of them are going to be innate to the pathogen. Some pathogens spread easier than others. Uh, it matters how the pathogen is transferred, whether it's airborne or a fomite or droplet transmission or direct contact. Um, reflects the infectious dose. 
generally speaking, if you get like one bacteria or one virion particle in you, you probably don't get infected. That's something that your innate immune system can easily squash and deal with. Um, but different diseases might have different dosage numbers, different uh, uh, what are called ID50s, uh, the infectious dose at which 50% of the population would uh, become, would come down with the illness. So uh, tuberculosis, for instance, has a very low infectious dose. It, it can only, it can take like, you know, a few tens of bacteria can cause tuberculosis, whereas uh, something like HIV actually has a much higher infectious dose. Uh, the immune state of the population also matters. If you're looking at a population, like the percentage of people who are immune, you kind of have to take them out of the calculation when uh, you're determining the attack rate. So incidence is the number of new cases per time per unit population. Uh, so you will often hear, uh, we're going to relate everything to COVID because everything is related to COVID these days. Uh, you, you will often hear that uh, in New York there were, um, you know, uh, uh, you know 2,500 new cases identified and diagnosed today. I don't know if that's the number. I don't know when you're looking to the, listening to this. But uh, that would be an incidence rate. The number of new people who get infected. The number of new cases uh, per unit time per population. So it's going to be like per day, per week, per month, whatever your reporting period is. doesn't matter what your reporting period is as long as it's consistent across everything. The prevalence is the number of total cases at any given time in a population. Um, and so, for instance, if you have a disease that lasts three days, and at the end of three days, you're going to either get better or die. Either way, you're no longer infected. You're no longer an infected member of the population than having uh, 100, an incidence of 100 people per day you know, it's never going to get above 300 people because the disease doesn't last for very long. On the other hand, if you have a disease that lasts for uh, three months and you have 100 people per day getting infected, then that's going to build. Like the first day it's 100, second 200, and you got like three months, you got like 90 days worth of buildup before anyone is getting cleared from that pool. So it could easily be uh, 9,000 people, actually, 9,900, yeah, 9,000 people before you start removing anyone from the pool. Um, generally speaking, we uh, express both incidence and prevalence in number of cases per 100,000 people. Uh, you know, usually if we're talking about epidemiology, we're usually using pretty big numbers. Uh, the prevalence tells you the overall impact of the disease on society. Uh, and you can have cases where the prevalence is extremely high, even though the incidence might be very low. Uh, some diseases remain infectious, remain contagious throughout their entire period. Uh, so, for instance, if you have a disease that lasts a long time, even though the incidence may be low, if you have a high number of affected people out in the population, each of those can act as a vector to spread the disease. Morbidity oops, is the incidence of a disease in a defined population. Um, basically, it is the likelihood that a random person in the population will become diagnosably ill with the disease. So the morbidity rate or the morbidity number 
is the likelihood if, uh, let's say we have, I don't know, a million people in Las Vegas, and it is the, the chance that you, a single person, will have, will come down with the disease, or it's the percentage of the population that will come down with the disease. It ends up that they're the same number, just looking at it in very different ways. Uh, mortality is the chances of death of a random member of the population or the percentage of a population that you can expect to die from a disease. So, um, and this is considering all of the people in a population, right? So if you are, if Las Vegas has a million people and, um, you know, disease X hits and the mortality is 10%, then that means you can expect 100,000 people to die. 10% right, of the total population. The case fatality rate is similar to mortality, but it is a percentage of the infected population that can be expected to die from a disease. That's, that's different because not everyone in the population might get sick. Um, maybe only a few people in the population will get sick. Some diseases don't, like you could have, uh, uh, well, let's actually take Ebola. Uh, the, um, the Ebola outbreak of 2015 in the United States, three people were infected. Two of those people died. That's a very low mortality rate for the United States. Right, it was point zero 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 one percent or something like that, because only two people died out of three hundred and fifty million people in the country. It was a very low fatality rate or a very low mortality rate. However, the case fatality rate was very high. Of the three people who got infected, two of them died. That's a case fatality rate of sixty-seven percent. So the case fatality rate is the chances that an infected person will die from their infection. Uh, to sort of explain the difference between incidence and prevalence, uh, a good example is to take a look at HIV populations uh, from 1980 to 2010, right? So there is no cure for HIV. If you get it, the only way that you ever get removed from the infected pool is through death. Um, so the incidence, which you can see here in blue, is the number of new cases, oops, the number of new cases per, and I think that this was month, uh, the, the data was, was collected. You can see here that the incidence is very low early on because there weren't very many infected people. And we didn't know much about the, the disease for, you know, the early 80s. And we didn't really get our heads wrapped around it until the 90s. So you see the incidence rises throughout the early 80s. You have um, the disease spreading and... Every month, there's, like, more people getting infected than the previous month. Uh, around the mid-80s, people start to actually realize that there's this thing spreading around. And they didn't know exactly what it was, but they knew that it was spread through sexual contact and that it was highly prevalent in the gay male community um, and among sex workers. And so people started getting, you know, a little bit nervous. They started practicing some sexual distancing measures using safer sex techniques. And you saw the incidents start to move down. Um, and then we got really, really serious about safe sex campaigns in the early 90s. We, by that point like knew that it wasn't a disease that just affected homosexuals. It was a disease that anyone could get that just happened to start in that community. 
um, and uh, you know, safe sex practices happened. You know, became much more common, and uh, the incidence dropped even lower and has stayed low ever since. So the incidence of HIV is pretty low right now compared to what it was in the 80s. Uh, but if you take a look at the prevalence here, you'll see that the, the prevalence has continued to go up and up and up and up and up. With one exception is this time in the early 90s when it sort of leveled off. Okay, and then right about here, it takes off again. Well, what happened? What explains this? Why do you get a leveling off of prevalence in the early 90s when you had a, uh, your spike in incidence was in the early 80s? Well, that's because HIV takes a long time to kill you. It, at least used to, uh, take about 10 years to go from when you first contract it to when you would die from it. So what you saw here is the disease is spreading throughout the population. Nobody, or at least not nobody, but um, fewer people are dying from it at this time. Uh, because, you know, to die from it in the early to mid 80s, you would have had to get it back in, in the, the mid 70s when it was just emerging. Um, but in in the late 80s early 90s people started dying from it in droves um lots of people were dying from it because all those people that got infected back here were starting to have fatal cases so what you see here the, remember with hiv the only way that you're ever going to get removed from the population is through death so if new people are continuing to be infected but the prevalence isn't going up, then that means people are dying as fast as new people are getting infected. And that's what's happening here in this part of the curve. Round about here, this is where um, we started to develop uh, really good antiretroviral and anti-HIV drugs that could, well, not cure it, could extend life uh, effectively indefinitely. Like nowadays, if you are HIV positive, your expected lifespan is not noticeably, well, it's definitely lower than the main population, but if you have access to good health care and good drugs, you might very well live just as long as anyone else. Um, and so even though the incidence was low at the time, and in fact was low, e low-ish, even if you go 10 years before then, the prevalence starts to climb after that point. Why? It, it isn't as if more people are, like, the incidence rate hasn't gone up. The incidence rate's actually going down. So you have fewer new people getting infected, so why does the population, the, the, the prevalence continue to climb at an increasing rate? Well, because we had good drugs now, and fewer people were dying. So if no one's getting removed from the population, but even at a low rate, people are still getting added into it, then your prevalence will continue to climb even while your incidence declines. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk at least a little bit about reproduction number, because this is one of those things that you hear a whole lot about uh, right now when we're talking about COVID. And uh, the reproduction number is not a constant, um, and it's actually very difficult to measure. And uh, it comes in two sort of varieties. There's what's called the basic reproduction number, and the effective reproduction number. Uh, the basic reproduction number is R0, or uh, it's usually pronounced either R0 or R0. Um, and that is an expression of the number of people you can expect 
uh, the number of new cases that you can expect to be generated from each case in the population. You know, for every person that gets infected, how many other people do they infect? If we're talking about R0, crucially what we're talking about is a population where everyone in the population is considered to be susceptible and where no intervention has taken place. Uh, the not, the zero means the initial R number, right? At the start of the epidemic, then um, how fast does the, uh, does the infection spread? And it's dependent upon a number of factors, right? Some of them are inherent to the biology of the organism. How contagious it is, is it? What methods it uses to spread? Um... Some of it is dependent upon environmental factors. So you kind of have to measure R0 differently in different places. The R0 in New York is going to be different from the R0 in, I don't know, rural Iowa. Uh, because people are packed differently. And uh, R0 and R uh, are both going to be proportional to the contact rate and the attack rate. So the attack rate we already defined. It's the likelihood that a contact event will result in infection. And the contact rate is basically, you know, how many people do you come in contact with per day? And different types of contact and different closenesses of contact are going to make a difference, but we just kind of average them out. The effective reproduction rate, or reproduction number, I should say. It's a number, not, uh, not a, uh, um, a rate. Uh, this is, it takes into account behavioral modification, like social distancing, as well as things that can decrease the attack rate of contact events. Uh, if, if you come in contact with someone and neither of you is, and you're sick and you're not wearing a mask, the attack rate is going to be much higher than if you come into contact with somebody and you're sick and you are wearing a mask, assuming we're talking about a respiratory situation here. But um, the, so this R number takes into account the changes. So it changes over time. It also takes into account the percentage of the population that is immune, either through vaccination or through um, having been infected and recovered. And so the, you gotta figure that if, if half the people out there are immune, right? Then that means half of your contacts, if you contact 10 people in a day, only five of them could possibly transfer the infection. So uh, R naught is the initial R value and R is the, uh, is the, the effective, the modified, the one that changes over time. And basically, while R is greater than one, the epidemic grows. When R is less than one, the epidemic begins to taper off as fewer people are infected in each subsequent contact event of the disease. This is a little um, map that I made, an epidemiological calculator uh, graph that I made looking at, I was experimenting with different factors for, uh, for the COVID outbreak. And so this is a, uh, uh, an estimation based on, um, the best numbers for COVID I could find at the time, uh, assuming, you know, like give it a estimation of the population this gives a reproduction number of 2.47 initially, which is the best number we have measured from 
the Wuhan data. And uh, so the reproduction number is going to be influenced by things like, you know, the attack rate and the contact rate, but also how long you have it, right? If you are only infectious for three days, you're going to come into contact with fewer people than if you are infectious for three months. So the length of incubation period uh, before you become infectious, um, the duration that the patient is infectious, uh, the time from incubation to death, uh, recovery time, hospitalization rate, things like that. And it takes all of those numbers and plots out a graph. This, this graph makes some good assumptions. So here, uh, this graph assumes that at day 31, intervention starts, and those interventions uh, decrease the transmission, decrease R by 55%. So we're assuming that R naught was 2.47, and that the social dis distancing innovation um, is going to bring that down to 1.11 at that point. And that's the number that you have to, to bring it down to uh, for the epidemic to become self-limiting so that it doesn't infect the entire population. Um, and so under this set of assumptions, and data changes all the time, this would result in about 500,000 people dying. Um, the highest number hospitalized would be a million which is about the number of like hospital beds that we have in the country. Um, and the total infected would be uh, about the highest number infected at the same time would be about one and a half million. So yeah. Last, uh, we've used some terms, and I should probably explain them. These are epidemiological terms for how a disease spreads throughout a population, and whether it is localized in time or space. So first is an endemic disease. Endemic diseases are localized by uh, location. Right? If we say something is endemic, that means it is always present in a population, um, but it's only present in that specific population. It might not be present in all populations. So, for instance, we would say that it, uh, malaria is endemic to the equatorial regions. Anytime you go to the equatorial regions, you're going to find malaria present. It's always going to be about the same uh, incidence rate of malaria. Um, and it's always been there. It's always going to be there unless we develop some sort of cure or better treatment for it. Um, but you don't find malaria outside of the equatorial regions. We would say that... Um, that uh, valley fever is endemic to the American Southwest. You will find cases of valley fever all the time at a certain level in the Phoenix Valley area. Uh, in Arizona, right? There's just always a certain number of people who get it. If you don't live in southwestern United States, you probably will never get it because... It's caused by a soil bacteria that lives there. And it doesn't live, say, in Seattle. So if you've lived your entire life in Seattle, never left Seattle, you have effectively 0% chance of getting valley fever. Um, you can also have diseases which are endemic to much larger populations. Like we would say that the common cold is endemic in the United States. Um, and actually it's endemic throughout most of the world. Uh, no matter where and when you look, you're going to find cases of common cold. And 
pretty much on average, no matter when and where you look, no matter what year you look in, you're probably going to find about the same incidence rate. Doesn't go up a lot, doesn't go down a lot. Sporadic means that cases show up from time to time, but they don't spread much. So with the uh, exception of a few time periods, we would say that usually Ebola is sporadic and endemic to Africa. You know, there's always, not always, but um, there's not always present. Occasionally a few cases, you know, every year or two, you'll have a couple of cases that pop up in Africa of Ebola and um, they usually don't spread. An epidemic is localized in time and space. So this is an unexpectedly large number of cases uh, that, uh, and, and here we're talking about incidence, not prevalence. So um, you can say endemic, is where a particular location always has a prevalence of a disease. With an epidemic, what we're talking about is a higher than expected incidence of a disease. Now, note that this depends on what the expected number is, right? So take Las Vegas. Um, say that normally in a month, there are uh, 50 cases of salmonellosis in Las Vegas, All right? That's the normal amount. Like you can expect in a month, there will be 50 cases. It goes up a bit, it goes down a bit sometimes. You know, during the high tourist seasons, it's gonna go up and during the low tourist season, it's gonna go down. But, uh, you know, you've always got you know, about Say this is 50. Somewhere around 50 cases per month. Now let's say that in uh, July of 2024, what you actually get during August is... 200 cases. We would describe that as an epidemic because that's way more than you would expect. And we would be able to look at that epidemic, look at, okay, where did these people get infected? What had they been eating? And maybe we would be able to trace that back to a um, some contaminated lettuce that got into the buffets and, uh, you know, a bunch of people ate that contaminated lettuce and got sick from it. And that would be an epidemic. And we could trace the source back of that, ep of that epidemic back to, you know, maybe whatever farm had the contaminated lettuce. Um, on the other hand, you know, like maybe during, uh, so this is a, a good one down here, right? So this is... Seasonal, the endemic baseline for, uh, let's say, uh, for, for seasonal influenza, right? For influenza. And you can see that uh, it is, you know, the, the incidence goes up and goes down, right? Depending upon whether it's, uh, you know, winter or summer. But it goes up and down with regularity. You have what you expect. And then here, boom, you see that spike. Way up. Way up above expected. We would say that's an epidemic. Right there. When the... Um, the, the incidence of new cases is higher than we would expect by a statistically significant amount. 
um, an outbreak is a group of cases at a specific time in a population that can usually be linked back to a single incidence. And a pandemic, right? So a lot of you will probably remember that there was some dispute over, um, you know, oh, they, they finally labeled COVID-19 a, a, a pandemic, a global pandemic in, in March. Well, here's the real thing. It was a global pandemic way before that. Uh, a global pandemic is just an epidemic that's happening on more than one continent. So if you've got, like, epidemics of a disease happening in Seattle, New York, Chicago, London, Sydney, Australia, and uh, Moscow, right? That's a pandemic. you got three continents multiple locations, each of which is experiencing an epidemic at the same time. So pretty much as soon as you had an epidemic in, um, you know, Wuhan and uh, South Korea and Seattle and, you know, Italy, that's a pandemic. But they didn't want to call it a pandemic. And technically, the World Health Organization is what makes these decisions. Um, they didn't want to actually label it a pandemic because in, um, in like, say, the, the swine flu, H1N1 uh, pandemic back in 2008-ish, uh, uh, they, they came quick out of the gate and they said, all right, it's in North America, it's in South America, it's in, you know, Europe, it's a pandemic. And people got totally freaked out and then it ended up being not that bad and people got really angry at the World Health Organization. You know, Why did you freak us out with all of this pandemic talk? Part of it is... The pandemic talk caused people to freak out, which caused them to alter their behavior, which affected the course of the disease, making it less, uh, you know, make, making it less uh, uh, prevalent because people worried about it. Um, but they were a little bit slow off the gun to label uh, COVID a pandemic this time because they caught so much flack for um, being very fast to label H1N1 a pandemic. But... Technically, according to the definition of what a pandemic is, this thing was a pandemic back in January. All right. Well, that is what I have for you. So that's epidemiology.